Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. The country experienced a car market bubble after COVID hit, propelled by inventory shortages from disrupted supply chains and the unprecedented stimulus sent to businesses and households. Now here in 2023, folks are beginning to wonder if we're in for a car market crash. Used car prices, which nearly doubled post COVID, fell throughout all of last year, though they've started turning up again in recent months. Also, lax lending standards and extending auto loans during the recent boom are coming back to bite lenders. As vehicle affordability hits an all-time low, 60-day delinquencies on auto loans are the highest they've been in more than a decade. Where is the auto market headed from here? Will patient buyers for new cars and used cars be rewarded with better values in 2023? To find out, we're fortunate to welcome Car Dealership Guy to the program. He started out as a salesperson on a used car lot and is now owner and CEO of a car dealership group. In order to speak freely without industry retribution, he actively shares insider updates on the auto industry anonymously on his highly popular social media accounts. Car Dealership Guy, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Been looking forward to getting you on the program for a while. Really glad you could join us now. As we discussed, I'll call you Guy going forward for the rest of the interview just to keep things easy. Um, look, a lot of questions here for you. Um, we have had a video or two on this channel in the past couple of months about where the car market is headed, and those videos have proven um, extremely popular, clearly a hot button item for a lot of people. So really glad you're able to come on the channel and uh, and share your perspective with us, because as I understand it, you know, based on your experience, um, you kind of know what it's like, you know, boots at the ground, uh, boots on the ground working for, you know, a small dealership, but then you've, you've grown the, the dealer group you now run, you know, into a, a very large company uh, and uh, kind of know what's happening at the high level too in the industry from your perch there too. So you kind of have, you know, both a, a ground level view and a 30,000 foot view of what's going on in the auto market. So let me kick things off with this very general question for you. What's your current assessment of the auto market right now? Well, Adam, I think that the industry is right now going through, I would say, a divergence, which really just means that I'm I'm pretty pleased with where new cars are headed. Overall, things are trending pretty positively, and I'll touch on that shortly. Uh, but on the use side, I don't really like what I'm seeing, and uh, we're seeing just the situation get a lot tougher. Um, I would say that you know the past week specifically, we just hit a new low from an inventory availability perspective, down to 2.07 cars in dealers' inventories all across the nation. Just to give you some perspective, a year ago, uh, that was closer to 2.5 million. And in 2019, that was closer to 2.7 million. So I think new car, I'm seeing it start to rebound um, and happy to double click on that, whereas used cars is actually deteriorating at the moment. Okay. Um, so it's almost sort of like a tale of two markets, right? You're saying, you know, news car looking pretty okay. Um, used car looking pretty tight. Um, and when you say okay for new cars, is that from like a dealer perspective in terms of profitability and, and you know, sales? Um, or is that from a customer standpoint in terms of getting a good value on a new car? Or is it both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> let's dig into that, right? So you have a couple of things going on in the new car side right now. Number one, you are seeing that new car inventories are up roughly 50% year over year, right? So there's just more inventory available for buyers out there on the new side. Now, what that doesn't take into account is that it's not evenly distributed, right? So your Toyota lots right now are pretty much empty. They don't have any cars and the cars that they're selling are going right to the customer's homes because they're already pre-sold. Right. On the other hand, you have brands such as Chrysler, Volvo, uh, Jeep, uh, Buick, which they do have inventory, um, a lot more than the average you know, brand in the industry. And these brands are actually offering some incentives on their vehicles. Um, you can get the car at MSRP or maybe even a bit below. And so it's sort of a tale of you know, two, you know, a tale of two sides here when it comes to what on the new car side, what is available, because just some brands have inventory and have figured out their supply chains. And really, mostly the Asian brands, uh, Toyota, Honda, 
um, uh, Kia, you know, they really are still struggling. And again, it's always a function of supply and demand, of course. Although, you know, I like to put a spotlight on Toyota, who has just not been able to figure out their supply chain, and they are at historic lows uh, when it comes to inventory availability. Now, it's not just inventory availability, but as I mentioned, um, I'm seeing some things that I like on the new car side, right? Well, you're seeing stuff like buyer incentives, um, where, you know, incentives are up roughly 50% quarter over quarter uh, right now, which again, all that means is that car buyers have a better chance of getting a better deal on a car than they did a quarter ago, um, because there can be, there's some more incentives on the market, which is likely driven by there being more supply available on the market and OEMs wanting to push these cars out. And then the third and last thing that I'll mention on the new car side is that markups are starting to disappear. And again, not evenly distributed. That's mostly on the brands that have supply. So all in all, I would tell you that on the new car side, things are trending positively for consumers. Um, I would also say that this, this things are trending positively for dealers because, you know, yes, you can sell fewer cars and make more money per car, but that doesn't help your, your long-term business, right? That doesn't bring you as many trade-ins. It doesn't bring you as many repeat customers. And so I think overall dealers um, are pleased, especially the ones that have more inventory, that they finally have cars to sell to consumers. Okay. So let's let's actually talk about inventory for a second. So during COVID, right, we had these massive supply issues, um, uh, you know, for two reasons. Um, one, you know, just getting components was a real challenge, especially we all read about the the microchips and stuff, right? That that kept a lot of cars from being able to be put on a lot. Um, and then we had uh, a ton of demand um, as people were getting stimulus funds. And, and one of the things they wanted to go spend it on was, was cars, right? So you kind of had, you know, a, a double-edged shock there. Low demand, sorry, low, low supply, high demand. Where are we in terms of ironing out the supply issues? Sounds like you're saying Toyota is still seeing some residual effects. Is it just them? And is the inventory kind of back to where it was pre-COVID in terms of the time it takes to, to get a car manufactured and on the lot? The short answer is no. Um, we are, I think we're still, if you look at what, you know, the, the economists in the industry are saying, you know, they're calling for at least till 2026, where we may start to see normalization. Wow. You ask, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's wild to think about, but honestly, I, I don't even think 2026 and I'll, I'll tell you why, right? It, right now, you have we underproduced 8.6 million cars over the last three years, right? 8.6 million fewer co- new cars entered the market. That's a problem, right? Because that means that now, if you go back, we're exactly three years since shutdown started happening for the pandemic. Well, we're not seeing as many um, lease returns coming back in, right? And the issue there is specifically, I want to say the number is around 20 to 25 percent fewer cars being returned leases. And all that happens is those are the cars that make it to the used car market, right? So when I tell you that we have fewer cars in the used car market, right, that's driven by these, you know, fewer cars coming back from lease. And it's all one big cycle. And so, look, when you underproduce close to 10 million cars in three years, right, typically in the U.S., we sell like 17 plus minus million cars a year, new cars. Um, And, you know, now we're projected to sell, say, close to 15 million over the last couple of years. It's been a little bit below that, a little bit more than that, uh, but hasn't been it hasn't been nearly the number it needs to be to keep, maintain a healthy market. Well, you're going to see a couple of things. You're going to see the prices of cars of used cars remain remain higher uh, because they are still the less the, the less expensive option in the market, and you're just going to see a function that it's going to it, it's going to take us a lot longer to get back to you know prices as they were if we even get close to that. And the reason I'm skeptical of that is because guess what? The cost to produce a new car has also gone up. And so it's not just the secondary market. It's not just fewer cars, but the actual cost to produce these cars has gone up. So will we see a mean reversion? Well, probably not, but we'll get pretty close to it. And you know, when will that happen? It's at least a couple of years out with you know all across the board. Be, and specifically for the used car market, but for the new car market, you know, it's going to be really brand dependent. And the brands that have more cars and have more incentives to push out those cars are going to, the prices will come down faster than the, the brands that just still don't have the cars to offer. And, you know, supply is not anywhere close to where demand needs to be. Okay. Um, and and you had said that some of those brands that that are having 
enough supply to you know start being able to offer incentives for brands like Chrysler, Buick, Volvo, Jeep. Um, all right, so a lot of great things that you just mentioned there. Um, first question is, as you said that there was a shortfall of about 10 million uh, cars with over the three years of since the pandemic hit. Um, yeah. And I was curious, it sounds like you're answering my question here. I was wondering, did we actually produce less cars or did we just take a lot longer to get the cars out in the world? Meaning we had, we had made, because we had all seen those pictures of cars that had been manufactured, but they were just sitting in these massive lots because they needed like a chip or a couple of chips or whatever. Um, and so, you know, I think there was assumption there that, that we would still make about the same amount of cars. They just might take a lot longer to get onto the, the market, but eventually they would and things would equilibrate. Sounds like what you're saying is, is no, we actually made a fair amount less cars during that period. Yeah, I think what I'm saying is that fewer cars were purchased by consumers. You know, every brand is different, right? Like ultimately you can produce a car and it can sit in the warehouse and it's not yet sold. But I think the bottom line is, right, we didn't hit that 17 million number of units that need to be sold annually in order to maintain equilibrium in the market. And that's ultimately the issue right now. Where are those cars in the supply chain cycle? I have no idea. You know, some may, may be waiting on one chip or a lot more than that. Uh, but the bottom line is if they don't enter that market, they don't get purchased, they don't get leased, right? That is not going to hurt you later down the line when you don't have that car also returning back off lease or, you know, being traded in so that it can enter the used car market and normalize the price levels across the industry. Okay. And that's, that's probably something that, you understand well that the average person, perhaps including me, doesn't think a lot about is we tend to think about the new mark car market and the used car market as sort of two separate universes. But it sounds like they really kind of breathe together, right? You, you, you need to have this supply of cars entering the new car market that then make their way through the used car market, maybe even back to the new car market as there were trade in as someone tries to buy a new car. So you really have to think about them as sort of dancing in tandem, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's all very, very linked because it, that's exactly where the, the used cars come, of course, from the new market. You, you need someone to buy that new car so it becomes a used car at some point. And that's that's what's leading to this, um, you know, really imbalance in the market. You know, people are keeping their cars longer than ever. And, um, you know, people are repairing, you know, just repairing these cars. The service departments are busy as ever. Um, and it's just, it, that's what happens in this type of environment where, you know, that average price of a car is up so significantly, whether it be used or new. And many people are, and of, of course, interest rates are at, you know, multi-decade highs, right? Like the average interest rate for a used car right now in the, in, in the country. And of course, this is average, not median, but still it's, it, it is a record. It's 14%, right? We haven't seen that since like the early 2000s. And so when you take, you know, used cars that are up, you know, 35, 40 plus percent in the last couple of years, and then you add these, you know, crazy interest rates on top of that. How can someone afford that? You know, it just presents a very, very challenging situation, which is why you have this, you know, dealers and everyone fighting over cars under $20,000, right? That's what everyone is fighting for right now. Those are the cars with the lowest day supply in the market. And frankly, they're also the lowest quality cars in the market right now because everyone is going deeper. Everyone's digging deeper in the well to find cars to sell in those price ranges. And you end up, you know, acquiring pretty shitty cars. And what does that what does that lead to? Well, it leads to higher repair bills. It leads to you know more expensive warranties. Um, it leads to higher mileage on the vehicles that people are purchasing, which again leads to higher repossessions. It's all one big cycle, and you know you just it's not. I'm, I just don't like where the used car market is heading at all. And I'm a used car dealer telling you this that you know I'm I'm very very concerned about where our industry is headed, and you know how it's going to impact consumers. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the consumer is really getting a raw deal here, right? Where they saw prices go bananas, right? And I think they had hoped that, okay, that's a pandemic bubble, but it's going to come down and it's going to correct. And at some point in time, I'll be able to, you know, get a car at a reasonable value again at some point, right? When saner minds prevail. But you're saying, no, because of these shortages, actually, uh, they're going to be propping up the prices um, of these used car markets, and it's going to be harder to find a car you want on the used market. It's going to cost more than you want, and if you want to borrow it, uh, borrow to buy it, you know, your loan's going to be a lot more expensive than you want. And it sounds like you're saying you don't see much relief coming, you know, at least maybe until 2026. Yeah, look, I think 
you know, to, to lay some shine some positivity. Um, I, I do think that if you look at okay, let's talk. So there are defaults are sorry, delinquencies, auto loan delinquencies are rising. Um, I want to say like I, I believe it's the 60 days days past due severe delinquencies are at like the highest rate um, since 09, even higher than 09. Um, and again, that's a still a small segment of the market. Um, so it's not enough to necessarily, you know, fix this, uh, to get this back to equilibrium, but you are seeing some stuff which could and could potentially result in um, more repossessions. Right now, these delinquencies haven't yet um, resulted in, in defaults. And so, you know, that it takes time for when someone is not paying on their car, it just, it, there's a process before that gets repossessed, it gets sold again in the market and whatnot. Um, but you are seeing some of that, which could put some relief, you know, if there are some major bankruptcies, you know, that could put maybe a little bit of relief um, on the market, say, such as, you know, Carvana. Um, although, again, I don't necessarily think that they would liquidate their inventory, but it could be, it could put some relief in the market because you have to realize that it's not just the cars that they're, um, that are on their balance sheet, but it's also the the pressure they put on prices at auctions and elsewhere, right? So there's, it's a double-edged sword when it, when it comes to them. But overall, um, you know, you, when you have you just you're gonna have a really severe shortage in the used car market for the next couple of years and you can only hope that you know that new car uh, that oems will really all across the board will fix their new car situation and you know begin offering more incentives maybe rates will start coming down somewhat uh and that'll all ultimately that may put some relief on uh on car buyers okay um this is such a fascinating sort of highly interconnected situation here um just some stats that I pulled from your Twitter account here that kind of buttress what you're saying here. Um, when you're saying that new vehicle inventory is up seven, 70% since last year, right? So we hear that and we think, oh, okay, great. The system's kind of, you know, equilibrating and solving itself. But then you say, well, but it's still down nearly 15, sorry, 50% from where it was in 2019. <laughs> so that really gives you a sense of, of how uh, low inventory shrank here, right? Yeah, and and percentages is, is is confusing, right? Because you know you look at a stock that you know drops ninety percent and then goes up one hundred percent, you're still down, you know, a, a serious amount. Um, and so I think similarly here, right? If you fall from three point five or uh, three point seven to um, you know to one million, and then you go up to one point seven million, well, you're still down fifty percent. Um, and and I think the other thing to consider here is that. The, the vehicles that are available in the market, right? It's not necessarily your inexpensive or, or well-equipped sedan or your Honda Civic, right? In many cases, it's the pickup trucks, which, you know, they are expensive and not everyone wants a pickup truck. And so it's, yeah, inventory is up, but in many cases, you're seeing that it's just, you know, not necessarily the cars that people want either. And so right. I think it tell you a complete picture when you look at that number. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to put another stat of yours up here, which is I mentioned at the beginning in the intro that um, auto loan affordability is the lowest it's ever been at this point in time. And um, you have a stat here that says there are only 3,000 new vehicles in the entire U.S. priced under $20,000 right now, which blew my mind. Yeah, and that's a true stat. And by the way, I actually think it's lower now. I think it's closer to 2000. And so um, that stat was from right at the end of February, right? We're now at the end of March. And, um, you know, just doing, a, I did a quick, um, one of my followers mentioned this and I looked it up quickly on cars.com. And it was very interesting to see that it's, I, I mean, I saw, I saw fewer than 2000 new cars available under 20 grand. So it's actually gotten worse. Um, on that front, where again, the, you see, like it, it shows you how this is not evenly distributed across every single type of uh, you know class of vehicle and price range. So, I mean, my brain thinks, okay, look, there's what 330 million people in America. You got to go back to horses. I'm telling you, carry. <laughs> well, we may have to. We may not. We may not have enough cars. We might have to, you know. Yeah. But but um, so. Is the reason that there are so few cars under twenty thousand is that the the manufacturers have just realized, for better or worse, um, hey, we can make more profit, uh, more total profit in selling to the more well-heeled individual that can afford 
the Tesla, the SUV, the the, the big truck, um, and the regular guy who's making fifty thousand a year or less can kind of just go pound sand and drive a used car if they can find one. I think that's a I think that's a part of it, right? Like, there's no doubt that the more expensive vehicles just are higher margin. You know, you you upsell all these features and you know this paint color and blah blah blah. Um, but I think it's more than that, right? Like you have to realize that the, the way interest rates have risen has happened so rapidly that it's it's put this imbalance, right? Like beforehand, buying a $50,000 or $40,000 car, right? Your payment was meaningfully, um, meaningfully lower than it is now, given how interest rates have risen. And so, you know, the bet OEMs have made over, you know, the past decade is that, look, consumers, you know, the American consumer wants that well-equipped car, right? We want our gadgets, we want our features. And, and so let's give them what they want. Obviously we make more money as well because we're, you know, we're selling more, more products and more options in those vehicles. But I mean, historically there really hasn't been um, the most demand for these, you know, micro like economy cars. Um, And, you know, the reason that they're selling out faster now is again, it just comes down to price point. Right. People need something they can afford. And, you know, and maybe when you don't have those options, you just go with what you can afford. So I think we should expect to see, you know, more of those cars being prioritized in the future. Um, if if just, a, you know, the, this economic climate continues or if it even gets even, even worse, because the reality is that, you know, if you just look at the numbers, right, the lowest days in sales, which means the lowest inventory availability for new or used cars is for cars below twenty thousand dollars. Right. That tells you all you need to know. It's the cars that people want and need most in this market. Okay. And is is the reason that um manufacturers aren't aren't producing more of them right now? Yes, maybe they, they make more total profit on the more expensive models, but but also that it just takes a while to retool your manufacturing line. And you know, I could famously didn't Ford. Like basically stopped selling cars a couple of years ago just to focus on the SUV and truck. Yeah, Ford did do that. They they stopped selling um yeah cars and they're focusing on their SUVs. Um, although you know I, I actually don't have a good answer for that question. I'm not sure what's holding up the manufacturing of you know the smaller cars. You know I, I will tell you that you know all across the board um, we still have you know like we mentioned earlier that we still have the. The, issue, the supply chain issues and that the brands that don't have them more or less right now that where we're seeing inventory creep up um, in many cases, that's, you know, brands that are heavy on trucks. And so, and again, that's driven by, of course, you know, price points that are just m- more expensive and you have less potential buyers in the market. And so I think, again, it's, you know, it's just overall um, velocity of production and, you know, going back to like the trucks, as I just mentioned, right? Like your three big domestic truck, truck producers, right? So let's look at Ford, uh, let's look at GM and um, and who am I missing? Our, sorry, our Ram, right? There you go. I don't know why I forgot about that one. Um, yeah, Ram specifically. Uh, you know, it's two different uh, two different departments but, or two different companies now. But you're seeing that um, Ram and Ford have roughly a 90-day supply on their, on their trucks and, and, and pickup trucks, right? And so, again, industry average is like 55-day supply. And so if you're at 90, you're almost double industry average in inventory availability, right? That's where you should expect to see some, you know, markdowns and some incentives start to appear. You're also seeing that um, uh, Chevy is at about 100 and or 108 day supply when it comes to inventory availability. And so even more Chevys available on the market, Silverados, right? Um, and so all that said is that the truck supply is, you know, is, is increased significantly. And you, you should expect to see the prices of those start, start to come down because there just simply is not enough demand right now, given where the prices are at. Okay. So that that begins to make sense to me, right? Which is, um, you know, we we had, as I said, you had a lot of stimulus getting pushed out to the, the average American, for better or worse, they spent a lot of it on cars and trucks. Um, but that's largely gone, right? Those, those stimulus uh, programs are, are long over and yeah, maybe there's still a little bit of the pig left in the Python, but it's, it's almost out. Uh, the economy is slowing, layoffs are growing, uh, housing markets looking rickety or real wages continue their monthly decline. I think we're at like, you know, two years worth of, of back-to-back monthly declines in real wages. Um, and then we had, you know, Inflation and gas, 
Um, you know, uh, it's it's moderated a little bit. Um, I live in California. Uh, we're still paying five plus you know dollars a gallon out here. So you know, hasn't completely moderated at least out here. Um, so in that environment, especially you know, if it looks like we are headed, you know, the odds of us heading into a recession are not bad from here. You know, it's understandable that consumers are going to retrench and start prioritizing more affordable cars. And you're saying, you know, that under twenty thousand, we're seeing go the fastest in the used car market. There aren't that by many. far, by far, yeah. There aren't that many in the new car market, and I guess uh, there's so few right now because of, of whichever ones there are, they're getting snapped up quickly too. So you're beginning to see the the trophy uh, inventory, you know, the 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 big trucks with all the extras and packages and everything beginning to sit for longer, right? Okay, so that that begins to make a little bit more sense. Okay, so now complicating things are um, <laughs> one prices got crazy high. And they haven't really come down very much. Um, like I said, used cars had been trending down last year. They're, they're trending up again this year. And, and I think for the factors you're talking about, where inventory is beginning to get tighter and tighter. So there's more competition for them. Um, but the cost of financing, as you gave a nod to earlier, uh, has gone back up dramatically. It's at, I think you said average loan percentage right now is about 14%. Per so use. here's another stat of yours. Nearly 15% of drivers who financed a new vehicle towards the end of 2022 are paying $1,000 or more a month. What will this look like a year from now? I mean, that is ridiculous to have a you know four-figure monthly car payment. Yeah, look when when that's when that's your average, I think it's uh it's it's just reached a concerning level. You know, I can tell you that if you look back to pre-COVID, right, like your average loan payment, car loan payment is up twenty nine percent, and your average lease payment is up thirty four percent, right? And so all payments across the board are just higher. And again, it's many many different reasons, right? It's our taste. It's it's just a consumer's taste for. <clears throat> well-equipped cars that have more technology. It's it's buying more trucks, right? There's a lot of reasons why this happens. Of course, it's now rates that are having an impact and it's supply shortages, which just increase the prices all across the board. And so you're just seeing this, you know, pressure being put on the consumer. And, you know, that's nice and dandy when the economy is driving, but when things, you know, start to slow, suddenly you're like, okay, well, I can't afford this anymore. And that's when you have lenders that are holding the bag. You know, you have obviously consumers that are holding the bag and it gets, you know, things start to get tricky. Yeah. Well, so that's what I want to dig into now, which is how they're getting tricky on the lending side. So from what I understand, loan standard, lending standards got very loose during the pandemic. And I think I'm saying that diplomatically. Um, in other words, there were a lot of loans that were made to people whose main criteria was they could kind of fog a mirror, right? You know, dealers were just really happy to just move product, get people off the lot. And so you mentioned we're beginning to see delinquencies rise, right? The 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 post sixty day delinquencies are the higher the the highest they've been since I think you said like two thousand nine or something like that. What I've heard from previous guests on this channel is that um, even the prime borrowers. Uh, the default rate, I think, went from like two percent to three percent, which are which are low numbers, but that's a dramatic absolute percentage increase. Right? It's like fifty percent increase, right? So, um, you know, are we sort of um, are are we seeing the beginning of a bit of a reckoning uh, in the auto loan market as potentially a lot of loans that probably shouldn't get made begin to get into trouble? Potentially, as you were saying, right at the same time where the economy is beginning to get into trouble, and you know, even if somebody could qualify for the loan in a good economy, maybe they've lost their job or gotten their income's been compromised otherwise, and all of a sudden, you know, they can't make their payments. So, are we are we entering a period here where you know lenders are getting real real concerned about credit or default risk? Yeah, look, in, in during twenty twenty one. You know, the loan auto loan rejection rate was below 2%. I mean, historic lows, right? Now you're at about, you're at a highest in six years, close to 10% auto loan rejection rate, right? It just means that like roughly one in 11 US borrowers is getting rejected for an auto loan now, right? So lenders are, have tightened, they are tightening some more than others. Um, you know, I, I always talk about 
Uh, if you look through my Twitter account, and again, please follow my Twitter account at Guy Dealership. And of course, I have a podcast now on Apple and YouTube. It's the Car Dealership Guy podcast, one word, Car Dealership Guy. But you'll notice that I shared um, I share stats about our lenders and what we're seeing. And I think it's interesting that you know near near the end of 2022, I would say we noticed that, um, and this is of course anecdotal. We're you know one dealer group, one one set of experiences. Although these things do transcend way beyond just our dealership. But we did notice that Capital One um, was sort of tightening the fastest. And after that came Santander, right? Uh, and they all do many, many subprime and near prime consumer loans. Um, and now we're seeing that, you know, every lender has gotten a lot more disciplined. It's a lot tougher uh, to sell a car now as a dealer. Remember, the dealer is at the mercy of the lenders, right? Because if you don't have a lender to lend money, uh, you know, unless you're doing the lending yourself, you're not selling a car. Right, the and car's consumer, not moving. Yeah, you're not exactly. buying a car. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, we're seeing that, you know, these lenders just have gotten a lot more disciplined. Um, you know, maybe maybe that's a good thing, right? Maybe it, they overswung over the last couple of years, but you're you're starting to see things on the street. You know, I talk to dealers and I see what's happening. You know, dealers are getting cut off from these lending programs. Of course, the weaker dealers that maybe have smaller portfolios or maybe are underperforming the most. Um, again, you're seeing, I guess, like I mentioned, higher rejection rates, and it's overall just tougher to get a consumer into a car. Now, to make things even worse, um, these car values are increasing again, used car values. But the book values, right, the, the values of which lenders actually lend by, right, a lender needs, the underwriter needs some book value to lend, you know, that's their, their guide. These values have not increased proportionally. And so what's happening is you have a situation where the market price of these used cars is going up, but the book value is not going up proportionately. And so that's putting the lender and the dealer in a tough situation because it's just tough to sell the car to the consumer when you can't get you know, a proper loan to value ratio on that vehicle in order to make the math work. Look, all that being said, it's just tougher to sell a car unless the customer has perfect credit or they have a lot of money down. Um, and unless you are doing your own lending, you know, it's probably not going to get any easier anytime soon. Um, and then the one other thing I'll mention is that, you know, this, you're seeing this start to manifest now in the public markets. For example, uh, Santander, they halted like a roughly a $2 billion asset-backed uh, security sale, you know, pretty much a portfolio of auto loans. They, they were trying to sell to the market. They halted that because they realized that the market is just, the market is dry. No one wants this right now. And it's going to be pretty tough to sell it off. And, and, you know, what, what happens there is that, you know, once they hold that, well, now they're also buying fewer new loans. And so everything is interconnected in that sense. Yeah. So uh, a lot of questions that kind of spiral out of that. Um, I guess, first question is, is you, we, you just talked about why the lenders are tightening. Now, do you have any sense is, is, is there tightening, are they going to tighten even more after uh, the current, um, uh, instability in the banking system. You know, uh, Jerome Powell, chairman of the Fed, said generally lending state he they expect lending standards to tighten as a result. Uh, and he said, you know, hey, that that's actually kind of acts as like an additional rate hike uh, on, on our part. Um, is the auto market sort of following suit there? Do you think? I mean, I think he's even behind. I mean, lenders have already tightened, and we are. I mean, we are going to miss our sales budget this month. I think I think it's going to be our biggest miss ever, right? And I think that's you know that's a testament to how unpredictable this has been and how quickly it's happened, right? We've never like our, like our sales budget and what we forecasted is just way way behind right now. Um, relative to, uh, real sales are way way behind, and it's 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 in it, we're, it's not that we're seeing fewer customers, right? We're seeing the same amount of customers, um, even in certain cases a bit more because you know we're grabbing maybe more market share. Um, of leads and interest, but we're just not able to convert. And you're so seeing more rejections on the loan side. Hundred percent, hundred percent, right? Or you're seeing unreasonable, unreasonable calls by these lenders, which like you know, customer can't afford this payment, and and or they don't have you know x amount to put down. Where just again, the numbers don't make sense, and it, you know, the math does it, the deal doesn't pencil. Okay, so that's there's a bunch of sort of second order effects that knock off of these lending standards, right? So uh, can, fewer consumers can get can get car, get approved for the loans to buy their cars, right? So then dealers sell fewer cars. <laughs> and obviously uh, the banks make fewer loans, make less money. Um, uh, 
how concerning to you is this element of tightening lending standards looking out at kind of the, the next year or so uh, in terms of how it's going to drive the action in the, in the car market? Well, look, you're going to see there's again, dealers were going to, are going to do less volume, right? Used car sales is or, or available inventory is going to remain, you know, lower than historical standards, which is going to buoy prices, no doubt about it. Um, you know, so prices, you know, I don't think the bottom is just going to fall out of used car prices. It just, it's just extremely unlikely given where inventory levels are at. It doesn't mean we won't have swings. Yeah, so ahead. sorry to interrupt, but folks that are calling for like a Carmageddon, right? Where just like, there's going to be just a flood of inventory later this year because dealers just can't sell this stuff. You don't think that's going to happen? Not on the use side. Um, I think it could happen. So definitely not on the cars below $20,000. Those are actually going to continue going up in price um, because there's just few, less and less of them really in the market. Um, cars over $20,000, you know, they're going to see, at least based on, you know, the, the forecast, they will still see above normal depreciation. Um, but we've already, you know, we did see a lot of it over the last six months and we probably won't see much more. I would say if you're, if you're targeting a used car over $40,000, you know, it's that's more of a buyer's market in some sense, because again, there's just you know less demand um, in that you know in that arena. Um, I think if you're you know if you're sort of like a deal hunter, you know probably you're probably better off um, to focus on the new car side and specific OEMs that just have lots of inventory. Now that doesn't mean you're going to buy what you want. I actually tweeted out a funny tweet a month or two ago where I said, hey, like. You know, Buick, like Buick lots are flooded with inventory. If you're willing to suffer the embarrassment of being seen in one, go get yourself a Buick. You may get a good deal. And so it was, you know, <laughs> sort of, it was sort of a joke, but it was also serious. Like, hey, Buicks have lots of inventory, and if you're not picky on car type, then yeah, go get a Buick. You'll probably get a good deal. And lots of people responded to me like, hey, I I bought a Buick because of this, and I got a good deal. And I'm like, great, that was the point. Um, but you're not going to see, you know, this quote unquote Carmageddon or anything on the used car front. It doesn't mean you won't see a wave of repossessions, right? That doesn't mean that's not going to happen because you probably will see that. And I actually think that you will see that as well. But the imbalance is so stark right now on the used car side that you would have to have, you know, the entire world get repossessed in order to, you know, really have a Carmageddon on used car prices, right? Now, look, I'm not a prophet. I can't see the future, right? If j hikes rates to 20%, yeah, you probably will see a Carmageddon um, because, and, you know, we're going to be in a depression and the least of your worries will be, you know, the car you're buying. Um, but I think, you know, with all that said, you're probably better off on the new car side if you're looking for a deal. But if you're looking for a, you know, for just an inexpensive, uh, inexpensive overall price, you're still going to have to likely come to the used car market because where are you going to get a, you know, a low mileage sedan on the new car side, you know, for that's well equipped for $25,000, right? You're not, uh, you're going to pay more money for that on the new car side. And that's the trade-off, right? Where on these cheaper cars or, or the used cars, you're paying, you know, you're paying relative, um, relatively to, you know, historical market value, a higher percentage, but on the new car side, you're just paying a higher absolute dollar figure. And so you have to make the trade-off. Can I afford that new car? Or, and if I can, well, guess what? I'm, I'm going to have to overpay for that used car because I don't really have any other choice. Or, you know, I can do some public transit or whatnot, but, you know, not many of us can can really, it's not really practical for all of us. So, mm -hmm. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, so on the, on the used car side, I, I just want to read this tweet that you you put out recently. You've mentioned a number of these points, but it's it's worth just kind of ending on this before we go to the next topic. You say the supply of inexpensive used cars continues to dwindle. You've been saying that all throughout this interview. We have 25% fewer used cars in dealership inventories versus 2019, right? 2.2 million versus 2.9 million. This is leaving many budget constrained consumers with no choice but to purchase older cars that are much more susceptible to mechanical breakdowns. And unsurprisingly, it's now becoming clear that selling older cars results in a higher rate of repossessions. Bookmark this tweet. We're going to see a lot more of this over the next 12 months. Um, so we kind of have this, this issue of, of unaffordability that's forcing people down the quality chain. They've got older cars. Those cars break down more. Um, and then, uh, you know, if the car's not working and the person still owes money on it, you know, it goes into repo usually probably not that long after. 
Um, so, and people just defaulting on their loans, as we've just talked about, because they become a lot more onerous. Um, how big of like a, a repo wave are you fearing here? And, and will that impact inventories at all? Or just as repos come on the market, as long as they're under 20K, they're just going to keep getting snapped up for the foreseeable future? Well, look, I think one one of the things I learned early in my career in this business, and one of the first thing I learned was that 50% of repossessions r- roughly happen because a consumer has some repairs that they can't afford. Right. And again, it's rough math, but you know, when you think about it, right, one in two people that have their car repossessed, it's because they start stop making their payments. It's because they just have a problem they can't fix, they can't afford it. That's the reason, right? Quality. And so for us, you know, we always prioritize quality from the early days because again, it's good for the dealer and the consumer, right? Obviously, you have a happy customer and you have, you know, a better portfolio. Your your paper performs better. Everyone, everyone's happier. Now, when you're selling these older cars. You know, it's, um, yeah, I mean, we can recondition it all we want and it's going to be nice and great car when we sell it. But at the end of the day, if historically we sell cars, I'm, you know, I'm giving you like a rough number, right? That have 50,000 miles, let's say, or 40,000 miles. And now we're selling cars that are averaging 70,000 miles or 80,000 miles. And again, that's an average. So some are even more than that. Well, you're running into an issue where, yeah, these cars are, they have a lower lifespan or, and, and it, you know, yeah, maybe some have more than others, but people are going to run into issues earlier and a large, you know, a large uh, portion of those customers that run into these issues earlier in their ownership cycle are not going to be able to afford those, you know, repairs and they're going to end up having that car repossessed. And so we should absolutely expect a higher rate of repossessions now that, you know, cars that are older are staying on the roads um, and, you know, they have higher miles and, you know, historical standards. Um, and then, you know, another thing I'll mention on that note is that, you know, I had a gentleman in my um, in my tweets mentioned that they operate a chain of 30 repair shops and that year over year, the volume they're seeing, the, the unit volume is is flat, but the repair order uh, the, the average transaction price has actually gone higher, right? And that's not only because of, you know, structural labor costs are up and stuff like that and parts costs. It's also because people are getting more work done to their cars because they're keeping them longer and they're buying older cars. And so not a surprise, um, but I think ultimately it will manifest in, in a higher rate of repossessions. And, you know, it's just really tough to predict what that really looks like. Um, but what I can tell you is that given all these factors that I just mentioned are unprecedented, we should also expect an unprecedented outcome uh, because, you know, we cannot rely on prior baselines as our current baselines because that's just incorrect. It's just not the case anymore. Okay. Um, you know, well said. Unprecedented times kind of everywhere these days, um, but certainly in the auto market. Um, I want to get to a couple of, of questions for you as we begin to sort of wrap things up here. By the way, Guy, thanks for giving us um, this is this is excellent industry insight. Um, really appreciate you giving us so much time. Um, you, you, you where, where to start, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, um, no. So um, I, I want to get to just sort of you know some general car buying you know advice for people that are looking to buy a car within the next year. But before we get there, um, you made a comment. I just would like for you to expound upon here a little bit. Um, you said that the 2010s was the decade of the used car dealer, right? These are the Carvanas, the CarMaxes, et cetera. They're all now facing Im- immense headwinds. And we've seen the headlines, you know, of the trouble that those, those, uh, those companies are in now. You say this next decade, the 2020s, will be the decade of the franchise dealer. Um, you mentioned a few by name, Asbury, Lithia, Group One, et cetera. Um, you say they're now supported by massive tailwinds. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. So again, I'm a, I'm a used car dealer, so this is not what I want to say, but it's the truth, right? Um, the 2010s, right? We were in a zero interest rate environment and it was just a, a huge tailwinds for the used cars and used car business. Um, you know, very, very low risk you know, used cars where uh, were extremely cheap, you know, you could get a very low rate on, on a used car, whereas today that's not the case. I mean, there's just all these factors that made it very attractive to be a used car buyer. Problem is now that's not the case any longer. And 
in addition to the fact that it's just more expensive and lending is more expensive and you know the average used car loan is 6% higher as in 6 points higher than the average new car loan nowadays um but also what you're seeing is that is that you know used car dealers are much more susceptible to these volatility and swings in the economy right and these interest rate swings have really really made it tough to be a used car dealer because you know in in Q4 um, we all took massive write downs on our inventory because you know interest rates started shooting up or shot up even higher faster and demand was down and inventory values just dropped um now the thing about being a franchise dealer which is why I'm a believer in it is that I think it's better to be a franchise dealer in periods of volatility or high volatility because it's really simple, right? Like franchise dealers just have multiple revenue streams. Um, they're not relying just on one single asset and, you know, used car to, to make their money. Yes, when you sell a used car, you make money in various ways, right? Financing, you know, and and warranties and blah, blah, blah. But the bottom line is, as a, as a franchise dealer, you know, you have a service department, you have a parts department, you have a new car department, a used car department. You just have many different ways of actually um, bringing in revenue and you're more hedged, right? You're not relying on used cars. Yeah, if there's not enough used cars in the market, well, guess what? You can you can sell more new cars. Of course, you're doing more service because if there's not enough used cars in the market, then more people are holding onto the cars. They need to come to you for service. And you're just able to offer, you know, different types of, um, you know, different types of services and products that can get you, help you weather the storm and get through these tough periods. So I'm, I'm very long on franchise dealerships. And I just think that, you know, the 2020s and really, you know, go, moving forward is, is just going to be their, their position to win as people do, you know, more service on their cars and as new car inventory begins to rebound. Okay. Makes total sense. You know, in this market environment, we have been hammering the drum of diversification uh, for people uh, in terms of a way to mostly protect the, the their wealth, but also diversification also has some prudent growth uh, attributes to it as well. So same deal here, rocky times in the auto industry, you want to be diversified from your income stream. Yep. Um, all right. So um, for folks that are, uh, you know, looking to buy a car, um, from, from what you've said, I, I'd sort of you know, intimate that, that you would say, hey, if you're looking to buy a, a new car, time's probably on your side. And, you know, look at some of these dealers that uh, that have enough inventory that they're beginning to, you know, um, take off their markups and begin to offer incentives and stuff like that. Um, on the used car side, I don't know, maybe you're saying, you know, it's going to it's going to remain bad. So just grab a good value the moment you, you see one. Um, but anyways, what what kind of advice would you give to somebody who is thinking about getting a car this year, but but has flexibility to take advantage of whatever conditions you think uh, are, are best for them? Yeah, look, if you're simply looking for the cheapest thing available, you're going to have to go used. Um, so I think that, you know, the more cash you can put down, right, the less you're going to be paying a higher interest rate, unless you're going to have stellar credit. Um, now, the one exception here is I will say, you know, credit unions have sort of stolen the show. So they're on average, like a couple points cheaper on a loan on a used car. And again, you know, credit unions have structural cost advantages to them. And so definitely, you know, shop a credit union. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't work through the dealer either. Um, you know, most dealers work directly with credit unions. And so you should absolutely, if your credit warrants it, and, you know, you, have, you, should, you need to have decent credit to work through with credit unions. Uh, but if you have decent, at least decent credit, then <clears throat> going through a credit union, you'll likely get just a better overall uh, auto loan. Um, and <clears throat> credit unions actually make up now 30% of all auto loans. Um, so that shows you, you know, how much they're just performing a lot better in this environment. And, you know, they have competitive advantages, right? Like just a couple of years ago, they were in the mid-teens market share. And so now they're 30%. That's very significant. Um, so that's what I would say if you're if you're really you know looking for something cheap. If you can, if you have a bit more money to put down, if your credit's a bit better, or if you're um you can afford even a little bit more than you know, say twenty thousand dollars on an all-in basis, I'd probably consider um a new car, at least consider it. Now, again, at the low 20s, you're still going to be buying, there's still very few and far in between, and you're still going to be buying something, you know, a small car that's pretty base model. Um, but as you go up to 30 and plus, you know, you're going to have more options there. And so, again, I would still try credit union, you know, shop them, see the best rate you can get. Uh, but if you can, if you can't afford that, if it's within your budget, you know, above that a 30K mark, I mean, yeah, I would probably start looking at 
a new car in that range. And then lastly, if you're if you sort of are, you know, you know, a cash buyer or perfect credit, whatever it may be, and you're, you know, looking for something, you know, like a luxury car, that is, I would say, that's where you have the most uh, flexibility. Um, you know, their days, their day supply for luxury cars is, is some of the highest in the industry. Uh, their prices on a year, a year over year basis have fallen more than any other class of vehicle. Um, you know, just over, and again, I'm talking about the wholesale markets here because it doesn't directly translate to retail markets. Uh, but still, you've seen that like luxury cars have dropped over roughly over 7% uh, in the wholesale markets year over year, more than any other type of vehicle. So I think luxury car buyers, uh, whether used or new, have some leverage and, you know, you have some 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 uh, opportunities to, you know, to get a good deal. Okay. Um, on that part, um, I was going to ask you, do you have any, you know, sort of like tips on buying a car? Um you know, so let's say you're you're in the market for a, a new luxury car. Um, obviously, you're doing pretty well if that's the case. But it sounds like you can go in there and really kind of horse trade with the dealers. That the dealers are going to give you the most, uh, you know, leeway in 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 you know haggling on the price. There is that is that accurate? Yeah. Look, I think you're like again, if you're looking for some super exclusive Porsche that there's only one of, you're, you're not going to get a deal. Um, it all comes down to, the, you know, it, it really is driven by, you know, inventory availability in big part, right? And so the more of the, you know, the more of the car is available that you're looking for, yeah, you're going to have just more leverage. And, you know, the dealer will be more inclined to, you know, come down on price or, you know, offer whatever they can in order to, you know, to help you buy that car. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that it's, it's a simple function of it. The simple heuristic here is like, if there is supply, you have more leverage. If there isn't, you don't. And and with luxury cars, with you know pickup trucks and and I, I actually I would not say full size SUVs because those are sort of an exception here. But really, with with pickup trucks and luxury cars, you are seeing that you're just going to have more leverage there. And I'm not telling you that the dealers are just going to you know, for lack of a, of a better term, drop their pants and just say you know take it. But they will um, they will be a bit more inclined to offer you you know to sweeten up the deal for you so that you end up buying that car and you know. And that they make a deal. So whereas a car under twenty thousand dollars, as I mentioned earlier, you know, they're that's going to fly off the shelf, and so you're going to pay full price for that car and some. All right. So uh, I'm going to ask a, a related and perhaps impolitic question. So forgive me uh, for it, but um, you know, for a lot of people going to the car dealer to buy a car, you know, it's like going to the dentist, right? You just, you, you know, you're girding yourself up for this psychological, you know, battle of where they're going to try to push all these greed and fear buttons on you and, and stuff like that. And I'm not, who knows how much truth there is behind all that, but, but everybody knows what I'm talking about. So I'm just curious um, as a, as a guy who has, you know, worked on the lot as a guy that actually runs a car dealer, you know, if if your mother or, you know, a family member were going to a car dealership to buy a car and they, they felt they had some leverage, like, OK, that 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 model has been sitting on the lot for a while or I see the dealer has, you know, several of the same model in stock. Um, any tactics you would suggest that that person use to try to get a good deal? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get this question all the time. I know. You do. <laughs> I think that. You know, it's less so about tactics. It's about being a smart consumer in the market. And the reality is, you know, the, nowadays with the internet and whatnot, like you need to do your homework beforehand, right? Know, know your situation, right? Go in, know where your credit stands, you know, have a pre-approval even ready before that to understand exactly, you know, what rate you're going to be at. Um, you know, know what cars you're considering. Um, I think just, you know, arm yourself with knowledge beforehand. You know, I... It, it is very helpful if you 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 make some calls and communication before entering the dealership because you know just like any business once you enter the dealership or any business for that matter where you're looking to do a deal you know you're you're sort of within control of that you know of the place and when you're texting or you're over a phone call you know you have more control over the narrative so I would say you know do your homework beforehand that's the key here second thing is you know communicate before actually entering the dealership right see a rough range of where it's looking. And I think, you know, once you find something that you like or you think is um, is the right deal for you or potentially, I think that's when, you know, you make it to make your way to the dealership and, you know, try to sharpen the pencil and, you know, 
and 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 leave with with the deal in hand. But I I think there's one thing that I would also add here, which is you know relationships. I think in times like these, when you know like cars are just not available like they were you know a couple of years back, I really do think that relationships matter. And um, you know if you know someone that works at a dealership. Um, or you know, a friend of a friend, a family family member, whatever. You know, I don't think it. I think it, it's very helpful to you know to to speak with them, to go through them, and you know, I, I'm just a big believer in that. It's it's uh in this environment, you know, you want to use sort of every tool available to you, and I wouldn't I wouldn't discount that. Even you know, you've seen all these you know all the brands and all the companies pop up in the last couple of years, which have sort of been like you know don't talk to anyone, but I actually think that in this environment, it's advantageous to speak with someone. Um, and if not for nothing else, just to, you know, get, get their take on it. Someone that you trust, of course. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's my sort of take for any, any potential buyers out there. Okay. So it's, it sounds like, you know, doing a lot of your, your homework beforehand and coming in with a, look, I've done my research. It tells me this model is worth about this much. I'm pre-qualified for this, like kind of, this is what I'm willing to pay for this car. Put that on the table early and see if it's a deal breaker or if there's a way to horse trade to something that both you and them can accept. 100%. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, one more practical question. So you talked about credit unions. Um, so I just want to make make this clear in people's mind uh, what to do here because, you know, we don't buy, the average person doesn't buy a car every year. And so you, you kind of get rusty on this. Um, so should somebody go to their credit union before going to the dealership and saying, I think I want to buy a car in this range, I'm going to need a loan of about X, then get pre-approved for the rate. So you're, you're walking into the dealer basically saying, I don't need dealership financing. I've already got this credit union pre-approval for this loan, which I want to use to buy this car for this price. Is that how it works? I wouldn't say I don't need dealership financing because I think you're pigeonholing yourself. You know, dealers... Many times they they get incentives from their lending partners uh, to you know produce loans, and so it's actually a dealer's incentive for you to purchase with a loan. In most cases, not all cases, in most cases. So I would I would I would just shop independently at the credit union, and then let the dealer show me what they what they, what they're able to get me in terms of rate and deal, and then compare the two. Because you know, in many times, you know, people come to us with credit union um, approvals, and we're able to beat that with our credit unions. Because you got to remember. Me as a dealer, I work with you know 10 credit unions, let's say, and a consumer might only be a member at one credit union, or they might go to one credit union's website and press get pre-approved. And so I wouldn't limit yourself, but I would definitely do your homework and check both your, you know, your own independent credit union and then also have the dealer that you're working with uh, check their, their credit union partners as well. Okay. So basically you come in and you say, I'm pre-approved for this loan from this credit union, and I'm using them unless you can beat it with your financing. Yeah, but I wouldn't even say that. I would just say, yeah, what can you do for me? Um, you know, I have some other offers, but just show me what you got. And, you know, yeah, you, I mean, you could say um, I, 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 you know, I'm getting pre-proof through a credit union, but I'm, you know, I'm eager to see if you can do better or something along those lines. So, yeah, I think I think that's the right take. OK, great. All right. Well, look, um, this has been great, Guy. Um, wrapping it up, I just got two last questions for you. Uh, the first of which the second of which is where can folks go to learn about you and your work? So we'll get there in just a second. But is there any other counsel you have for today's car curious American that we we haven't already touched on? No, look, I think we're taking the medicine right now, right? We've been in this crazy kind of free money, you know, years for a very long time. And now, you know, couple, and now that that's gone away, coupled with the fact that we have less inventory. I mean, we're going to all have to face, you know, some reality here that, you know, the inventory and the vehicle situation in America is just not what it was, and it won't be for at least several years, if not longer. You know, I'm sure anyone here that's traveled and been to Europe and been, you know, to the Middle East and Asia has seen that, you know, owning a car in many of these countries is a lot more expensive. Buying a car, is, you know, they, they don't, it costs more. And, you know, it's in, in a way, like, that's what I'm equating it to. I mean, we we are, the the, the vehicle situation in the country is, you know, it's, it's it resembles a lot more of what I've seen around the world, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but nonetheless, I think, you know, it's important to just, you know, stay positive, know that, uh, you know, we all need cars for different reasons. Some need it for leisure, some need it for work and whatnot, but there are still deals in the market. You are still able to find, you know, all it takes is one, right? You don't need to buy 10 cars, you need to buy one car maybe. And, you know, build some relationships with the right people 
Um, you know, find reputable dealers. You might have to wait a bit, right? Start early, right? If you're looking for a specific car, start three, six months early if you can. Um, there's always benefits to that. Um, and just know that, you know, the new car situation is improving overall. Um, it's not evenly distributed just yet, uh, but it is getting better. And ultimately that will trickle down to the used car market as well. And, you know, I do think that I am an optimist. I do think that things will get better for everyone and all the consumers and dealers within a couple of years, but it will be, it will take some time until we really get to as close as possible to pre COVID levels. Okay. All right. Well, well said, you made me think of one last question. I'm going to squeeze in here under the buzzer, which is, um, we didn't talk at all about the private market for used cars. And I'm just curious, you know, the, the, the Craigslists and whatnot. And I'm just curious, what dynamic are you observing there in that market, given the tightness of used cars right now? Is it becoming a better place to find a good value or a worse given these dynamics? I think it's, there's, you know, positives and negatives to, to dealers, private market, all that. And I think it's another place depending on the consumer. You know, um, I just recently invested in a company called Private Auto that I tweeted about. And their their whole thesis is, hey, we want to digitize the private sale, right? So to make it really easy and trusted um, for anyone that wants to buy or sell privately, right? Now, why do people want to buy and sell privately? And, and there's many reasons for that, right? Typically, uh, consumers do that because maybe the seller wants to uh, retain more margin and, you know, get pretty much get more money for the car or at least keep more money after they sell the car. And as a consumer, right, you're going to just simply go where there's inventory. And so if someone decides to sell their car privately, because that's their choice, maybe they use private auto, maybe they use Facebook marketplace, maybe they use Craigslist, whatever they choose to use, um, then, you know, if that car is there, then yeah, you will pursue that, you know, if, and you want it, you're going to pursue that deal. So I think the private market, um, I don't have any specific data or stats on it, um, but I will tell you that, you know, it is right now in, in many different, there's there's several companies trying to digitize the process, make it better, make it seamless. And I think the timing is, uh, you know, is pretty good given that, you know, given with the state of the inventory and consumers looking, you know, for a bit more of an efficient market marketplace where they can, you know, trade, trade um, cars between themselves without having to go through necessarily a dealer if they don't need the financing or whatnot. Okay. Um, it'll be interesting to see what uh, what innovations some of that new technology might bring. Um, all right. Well, look, Guy, um, for folks that have really enjoyed this conversation, maybe this is the first time uh, they've been exposed to you. Um, if they'd like to follow you and your work, uh, where should they go? Yeah, Adam, really appreciate this. This was, this was great. Uh, so as I mentioned on Twitter, at Guy Dealership, that's by far my biggest platform. I have 340,000 followers there. You know, love just sharing my insights. Um, you know, pretty uh, pretty sporadic as I think of things and whatnot. It's it's all, it's all me. There's no ghostwriters. So follow along, uh, enjoy the journey there. And of course, um, you know, definitely check out my new podcast that just started. I did one nine minute episode, and so I guess I'm a podcast for now. Uh, but I'm excited to do a lot more. Uh, I climbed up to the number one podcast in the leisure charts. I was gonna say I saw that. Congratulations! Yeah, I appreciate that. Within 72 hours, I was actually really blown away. Um, you know, never imagined that, but it's super exciting and very motivating. So if you look up on YouTube, you can find it at car dealership guy. Uh, don't be spooked. There's no videos yet. I'm not, I'm not that fancy just yet, but I'll get there. And then on the Apple podcast or anywhere else, you can just search uh, car dealership guy in one word and subscribe, follow along. And I'm just excited to share uh, more insights and kind of give you an inside peek into what's happening into the industry. Great guy. Uh, so guy, I follow your, uh, your Twitter account. Uh, it's a great account. Um, you give a lot of great observations like you gave here, but you, you just share like a ton of charts, um, several of which I've already shown during this uh, conversation. I read a number of your tweets. Um, anybody who's even mildly interested in the car space should definitely sign up for that Twitter account. Um, and Guy, when we edit this, I'll put up the URLs uh, to your that. Twitter account awesome. and your podcast on this. Folks should definitely go go subscribe. Um, and and right, the, one, the one last plug I'll put is um, I do have a newsletter as well, which is 40,000 subscribers, you know, growing really quickly. And that's great for people that are looking for, um, you know, in-depth analyses. Um, just, I go, I just do deep dives into specific things related to the market, inventory, lending, whatever it may be, uh, you know, large following by the financial community, large following by dealers, you know, large following by consumers that are just looking uh, to know what's happening. So the newsletter, you know, all this is really available if you go to dealershipguide.com, right? So that's my website that links you to everything, the podcast, the newsletter, the Twitter account, dealershipguide.com, check it out. And, you know, excited for you to follow along. All right. Awesome. And we'll put up the URL for that too. 
All right. Well, as we wrap up here, just some quick housekeeping. If you're one of the many people that's been asking me if we have replay videos of the recent Wealthion conference because you missed it and heard it was great, the answer is yes. Uh, you can purchase replay videos uh, and of, of, of all the presentations as well as all the live Q&A sessions with the speakers by going to Wealthion.com slash conference. Um, and, uh, you know, tricky times in the market, as, as uh, Guy was saying, uh, these are unprecedented times in many ways. Um, uh, difficult if you're buying a car, which is a, a very considered purchase, maybe the second biggest purchase for many households besides um, uh, buying a house. Uh, if you, you know, want advice on car purchase or, you know, on a bigger level, what to do with your finances and protecting your wealth, given this uh, uncertain macro environment we're in. Um, we highly recommend that you should be working with a professional financial advisor who understands all the issues that Guy and I were talking about in this program, but that I talk with you know, all of the experts that you see on this channel every week. If you've got a good one who can do that with you, great, stick with them. If you don't, or if you'd like the input of, of one who does, um, feel free to fill out the short form at Wealthion.com and schedule a uh, personal uh, free consultation with the financial advisors endorsed by Wealthion there. Lastly, if you enjoyed this conversation with Guy, uh, and would like to see him come back on the channel and other more great experts like him, please do me a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below. What was that little bell icon right next to it? And one quick point about that bell icon, I've been hearing from a lot of users that the, they are not getting updates when Wealthion issues uh, a new video. And to be able to, to get those updates, you have to have that little bell icon click down there. So even if you're a longtime viewer of this channel, just take a second and see if that bell icon is activated. And if it's not, click on it. Um, that's the way, again, you get alerted whenever we issue a new interview on this channel. Uh, all right. It's been wonderful. Um, Guy, thanks so much, buddy. This was just an absolute great conversation. Look forward to having you back on again this channel in the future. Thank you so much, Adam. Appreciate it. And everybody else, thanks so much for watching.